it's great to be here. Um, my first trifork. So, um, yep. So I've got two. Uh, so I've got two sessions. Uh, and this one I'm, is, is going to be, the, if you like, the high level. And tomorrow morning, then I'm going to talk more, go down into more details about, particularly in the new project I've got, the solid, the, the, the project called Solid. So this one, uh, past, present, and future. This is going to be looking back. This is looking at the state of the web at the moment and looking about uh, what <coughs> uh, sort of re resolutions, if you like, about the future. So, yes, the next computer uh, was, in fact, a really uh, cr uh, critical part of the development of the web. I should put it in context, I suppose. Uh, <clears throat> to really put it in context for me, I grew up, I was born in 1955, so when I was, uh, when I was small, my, well, my parents actually met uh, both working on the earliest digital computers. They worked on the Ferranti Mark I, which is the earliest computer in the UK. My mum programmed it, my dad helped design it, and uh, there was a little, just a little tin hut on the end of it. The, there was a big Ferranti electronics uh, factory in the end of it, that there was a little tin hut, and in that tin hut they built the computer. Uh, and various people met at the tin hut. My parents were two, they got, got together, and they produced me. And so uh, I gather that, uh, that early on, for example, at one point, uh, my mother went to, to a client, somebody who installed one of the computer, these Mark I computers, and uh, when I was actually in utero, uh, which, and so she was, some call her the first uh, computer, the commercial computer programmer because she actually, they actually sold it to a commercial uh, Company, so those, that was exciting. Those were very exciting times, and I suppose I, so. I grew up in this spirit of uh, the spirit of of the imitation game. If you like, you know, the, uh, the imitation game is about Alan Turing's disco dis <coughs> discovery that if you think about a, if a if a computer is a computer worth its salt, if a computer is a computer which can compute at all, then your computer can emulate my computer, and therefore. Because one computer can, can emulate the other, they can both do the same thing. If you pro can program yours to do something, then I can program mine to do it, because I can, if necessary, just program mine to emulate your computer, and I can run the, your program on my emulator. And therefore, all computers are equivalent. And therefore, if all computers are equivalent, the things you do are limited only by your imagination. They're not limited by the computer. So that was the really exciting... Uh, <coughs> spirit in which I grew up. So my parents were mathematicians uh, at the time, so I grew up, there wasn't any computer science, uh, so I went to Oxford and did physics, uh, and I got to play with some computers. I got thrown off the computer for using it for inappropriate things. So <clears throat> great urge to build my own one. I did build my own one. I got, when the 6800 chip came out, I was lucky that I, I, I was of the age, so that at the point when I was, so I was, I was uh, my, I was getting through my teenage years and starting to get more serious about my projects, and I got to the point where I could, I knew how to build a computer, if necessary, out of transistors or out of gates. And gates came along, but then the chip came along. So I rode the wave of the microprocessor revolution because I built my own computer out of a 1600 chip. That's two, two inch long CPU, and <coughs> built all the rest of the thing around it. And so I ended up doing, becoming, uh, a consultant, worked for various places, discovered Geneva. I think some of you guys hang out in Geneva. I got some work in Zug, in Canton Zug, at uh, Hindenburg, and Kram, and places like that. And uh, so um, I went uh, and was available in general to help people figure out how to build systems using, uh, using, uh, com using microprocessors instead of using computers instead of hardware. And so that was how I ended up at CERN. CERN just had a call. We need bright people to help. We have underestimated how long it takes to build a uh, control system. So I felt, first went out to CERN, in fact, in 1980. Exciting, great place, uh, if you haven't. Who, uh, who has been to CERN? You have to hold up your hand as well as using the app, because I don't have the app, app from the app. 
Not very many of you. You all should go. It's really exciting. It's a great place. What was exciting about it then was the, well, apart from the fact they had, they were building these huge machines, had these huge projects and doing, and they're pushing forward the boundary of physics. What was exciting about it also was that it was a very heterogeneous, uh, very high level, lots of uh, uh, intellectual level, but and these people came to build, uh, uh, build experiment, these uh, physics experiments from all over, and they came from different universities, and they used completely different computer systems. And in fact, so when you look back, <clears throat> so I went originally in 1980, I went back as a fellow uh, in 1984, and when I was uh, at that point, if you looked around CERN, you'd have found the two competing mainframe computers, you'd have had the CDC machine and the I IBM machine, uh, but lots of mini computers had just arrived, and people were starting to use Macs and PCs. Sort of, um, uh, a typical physicist would have a Unix workstation on their desk. And so you've got these Unix machines, you've got VAX VMS operating systems, you've got the old mainframe, lots and lots of different operating systems then. And each of those operating systems had its own documentation system, its own help systems, its own manual systems. And so they were all completely uninteroperable. But, okay, so this is 1989. So when I arrived at CERN in 1989, that was 20 years after 1969 when the internet was invented by Vince Cerf and so on, right? So I'm at CERN, but the internet has been invented 20 years ago. It wasn't really... Uh, a, a, it wasn't a policy in, in Europe to use the internet because it wasn't a, an international standard. Um, in 1989, just getting to the point that it spread throughout America, and so if I decided I wanted to use it, that uh, it, it was becoming politically acceptable. The uh, <coughs> the story, I think, the the. Uh, so my f favorite bits of, it, uh, of the story is the role that my boss, Mike Sendel, played. I was at, in a physics lab. I was telling all people that you know, we, we should build this, this global hypertech system. Uh, if we just write a little bit of code on top of each of the existing documentation systems, we could write a, a shim layer to adapt them to a, a sort of some universal space, like one big, uh, <clears throat> one big book. And a lot of people, nobody sort of really understand, understood what it would be like. But Mike, uh, in fact, uh, he had a twinkle in his eye. And his, so the, his uh, solution to this problem was he said, well, uh, never mind the hypertext, the global hypertext project, but let's do one of what we, let's try out the next machine. Steve Jobs had just produced the next computer, this really cool black uh, development um, system, black magnesium cube with sort of fins on it, looked a bit like a sort of a cross between a motorbike and a, and a, and a pile of uh, vinyl uh, records. It had uh, a very cool uh, kernel, it had very cool new optical discs, it had also a very cool uh, um, uh, development environment with, the, with a user interface builder. So we had a graphical user interface builder for graphic building graphical user interfaces. And so that was worth, you know, that was worth, as we were in the computing department, Mike said, we, you know, you, you, you're interested, why don't we buy it? Why don't we test it out? And let's test the development environment. And if you want to test the environment, the development environment, then you will need a program to test it on. So pick a program, any program. Uh, why not that hypertext thing you've been talking about? So <clears throat> he had a twinkle in his eye, and when he, and unfortunately he um, was diagnosed with, with, with cancer at that point, and he died uh, about 10 years later. But, and his wife, Peggy, when she went through his things, she discovered the copy of the memo that I wrote. And in the corner, in his writing on the front cover, in the top right, he had written, vague but exciting. And so, <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> Otherwise, if you'd have thought it was exciting but vague, then uh, 
uh, he, he maybe wouldn't have let me get the next machine. So I got the next machine, wrote the code. It took about two months to actually get the, the first web browser working. I had the, web, had the web server running on the same machine, the web server, all the, the web code. You know, if you, you, you're technical people, you know that it's really simple. The whole, you know, basically the, the web design is really simple. Just URLs are just like, you know, these things that start with HTTP colon, they're just like, File names with a bit added on. Uh, the web server isn't very much, wasn't very much c code. I tried to make everything look. Uh, I I tried to make everything look like other protocols that people have seen. I tried to make HTML look like the version of SGML, the markup language they used on the mainframe, so that the people who made their documents on the mainframe would look at it and think, Oh yeah, I can do that. And I made HTTP look like SMTP and NNTP and FTP and all the other transfer protocols that were out already out, uh, out there on the net. And <clears throat> I, know, I tried to sort of get people uh, in, excited in it, uh, about it. I, got, I wrote the code in 1990. By the time I got to 1994, I had realized that I had to, uh, that staying at CERN was, was uh, Fun, nice, wonderful, wonderful to be in Switzerland, great view of the Alps. But CERN itself didn't know how to start an industry consortium. MIT did. MIT did, INRIA, the, the lab in France did. And so the consortium was formed with two legs, one in France, one at um, uh, INRIA, one in, at, at MIT. We later, uh, uh, we now have, uh, it now has legs in, um, in China and Japan as well. And so, uh, at that point, I had to, had to move to the States as well because the internet had spread only in the States, really. So because the internet hadn't really been endorsed by the European community, um, with a small c, uh, the web had spread over there. And so, if you like, at that point, if you look at uh, people on a bobsled team, uh, I've never been on a bobsled team, but it looks as though, first of all, you've all, the, the, you know, the first job is you, have to, you sort of have to push this thing, and you push it, and you push it, and you push it, and at a certain point, it gets faster and faster, and there's a certain really crucial point at which you get in and steer. And then, <laughs> and then, and 1994 really, was, or maybe 1993 was that point for the World Wide Web. I had to get in and steer. People involved in it wanted to, uh, people who were, working for computer companies where they hadn't really said anything publicly, like Digital Equipment Corporation had maybe one public-facing uh, uh, web server, but actually 50. Inside the firewall, everybody was setting up web servers. Everybody was starting to play with this technology. Uh, so they said, oh, we want to be involved in, in keeping it one web. And so that the crucial thing, I think, the thing I got right about the web, and if you're working on web technology, you should try to uh, <coughs> maintain this. It was universal. The crucial thing was it, the, the design. I looked at all these different systems, the, the documentation systems, and whatever new documentation systems people had produced, they always ended up basing it on one particular technology. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, <coughs> they would say, you know, you have to use HTML, or you have to use Unix, or you have to use Microsoft Word, or, so, or you have to store it on a Unix machine. And, and in fact, I realized that the web had to be universal. It had to be universal on any hardware, any software, any operating system. Um, uh, it had to work with any culture. At the time, we didn't have Unicode. Unicode wasn't a thing, but uh, there was but there was ISO Latin One was the best, uh, uh, which would work for the European countries. But uh, and so later on, the Web Consortium moved everything to Unicode, and now of course everything you should everything you should you should be in Unicode, and everything now I design uses, uses <coughs> UTF-8. So universality, 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 and that universality of the technology meant that it ended up spreading. The fact that it had been designed so that you could put anything on the web, because the power of the hypertext link is that it can, when you make a link, when you write a blog, when you make a link, you can make a link, you can point to anything. Then the technology which allowed you to put anything on the web ended up with pretty much putting people put kind of everything on the web. So there's a lot of stuff got put on the web. <laughs> 
And in the early days when people got online, because they didn't understand that it was a, that there was a, that it was a, a sort of web without <coughs> sort of borders, they would people would get to spend all night in the computer uh, t ticking over the cellar and the ticking over the m the phone line and and surfing web surfing. Uh, Going, we sort of, oh wow, this links to this, and this links to this, and this links to this, and, this. and to a certain extent, there was a disease people got that they, they felt that they had to, because there was, <clears throat> you could put anything out there, they had to, had to read everything, but then afterwards, then the, the then, and now the new generation uh, <laughs> arrived and realized that actually, you don't, it's fine that everything's out there, you don't have to read it all. And in fact, the, <laughs> But in fact, behind that, there's actually a really interesting philosophy, which uh, for a while I had to explain to people, they would say to me, Tim, there's bad stuff on the web. And, and I'd say, yeah, I mean, the, the web is humanity. If you go on the web, you will find good stuff and you will find bad stuff. You will find humanity. Just read the good stuff. Right? It's not like email. It's not like spam, which people throw at you. You have to, you always do to read the good stuff. And that philosophy, Seems very logical, okay. Uh, it, when you just you just live your life so that you read stuff that you feel makes sense, you enjoy, which you can use uh, to live your life and to play and to work. And <clears throat> what could go wrong? Well, what could go wrong is that. We, re we discovered a couple of years ago that while I'm happy and you are all happy, maybe all the <coughs> following links between the same, uh, between these websites which are scientifically based and ignoring and just not worrying about the fact that all that exists because that, all that, that stuff that exists doesn't hurt us. Well, while we are doing that, meanwhile, the stuff does exist and also there are a large number of people who read it. And there are a large number of people who believe it, and they vote. <laughs> that is the problem. Okay. So the Web Foundation, if you, uh, after the Trump Brexit elections and Cambridge Analytica and everything came down, the Web Foundation, the first thing we did was to blog to say, whoa, mid-course mid correction. We have been keeping it free and open. We have been assuming that keeping it free and open will be all we need to do. Actually, we need to do. We need to do more stuff. It's not just about keeping it free and open. If the web is to serve humanity, it's also got to be net a constructive side. It's got to be net something which, which produces truth more than fiction. That it produces, a, as a basis for democracy, uh, it seems to, no, democracy depends on facts. People knowing stuff about the world. And facts depend on science. And the way people find out about the facts, and, <coughs> and uh, you know, the web has got a large part to do with that pr process, and the web has been serving a lot of people fake stuff. So, uh, so, so uh, I think a lot of people, with, and the, a lot of people, the Web Foundation in general, uh, um, with me, decided, you know, everybody decided, okay, we need to address this. It's no, we have been fighting for net neutrality. We've been making sure that, that the internet platform itself is free and open to everybody. We've been making the, sure that the web platform built on top of the internet is, is, is free and open and open for anybody to create whatever they want. But now we have to actually look at what people are really doing. We have to look at the platforms. We have to look at the things like Reddit and Twitter and Facebook where people are actually doing the politics and, f uh, and look at and find ways of measuring. We never thought that was our business, but now we realize that if you're concerned about the web serving humanity, it, you do have to make it your business. And so <clears throat> that was a sort of a reckoning. So the arc of the web seems to me, <laughs> it started off almost 30 years ago with this sort of meteoric rise Meteor rise is a bit crazy, isn't it? Because actually meteors come down. So uh, um, uh, I've always, somebody's meteoric career, I've always you know, <laughs> thought was a funny phrase. That we, so, uh, it, 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 but it was a glistening, excited rise. It started off with John Perry Barlow writing, uh, you could look at his manifesto for cyberspace, which says, when we are all connected with technology, 
then we will figure everything out. You know, we, will, we won't need laws, we won't need countries. Uh, so very Lenin-esque, sort of imagine there's a world without, without any countries because on cyberspace, actually, there aren't any countries. So we've got one. Uh, so bingo. And so there was a lot of excitement when it took off then. And then, and now it seems to come to a place where it could be, it's heading for potentially very dystopian uh, situation with all sorts of nasty stuff going down. A lot of heat crime, a lot of bullying, uh, a lot of fake news, a lot of manipulation of electorates, all kinds of the lists of things which are going wrong on the web is huge. I think for a while, perhaps back here, people were a bit worried about privacy. The main thing, if you ask people what, was, you know, what were the issues with the web, well, they say, well, the problem with the web is it's great, but you do, people, the consumers do a deal with the devil. Consumers do a deal with the devil because they, the only reason that they can get it free, and it's so good, they need it, and they, but they couldn't afford it otherwise. And so what they do is that they give away all their personal data, and that personal data is monetized and abused and by the big companies, and then it's because it's that, that data is sold by the big companies that that they can get to use things for free. And so, in fact, there was a big question mark around that. There was some, you look at the blogs which pointed out, actually, if you do the, do the math, working out the data, the monetizable data value of, the, of somebody's personal data, it's actually, it's less than what they pay for internet access. So if instead they paid for the services instead of... Uh, <clears throat> instead of the company being getting paid by monetizing. And if, when you look at that also, when you look at, for example, Facebook, actually, you know, Facebook's business model isn't selling data, it's advertising. And, it's, uh, and if you want to advertise, it's a very good place to advertising because the targeted advertising is brilliantly effective. If you want to advertise to a particular group, then you don't waste uh, people's time. You don't waste your user, other users' time. You, don't, uh, you find people rapidly very effectively. And so really, Facebook isn't that they sell data, it's that they do targeted advertising. There are, a few in, there are some interesting papers people have written about how if you have a world which is only driven by advertising, um, then, the, then you will end up necessarily having companies which end up just being trained by the advertising machine, just being trained, trained like a dog to, you know, to perform, because the advertising machine will give them more money if they get their users to engage, click. If you get their users to not do what the user was trying to do, but do something else and buy something that they didn't need. If you can get the user to do that, then you get money. And so companies get trained to get money. People Developers out there get trained to developers in, in Venice and Macedonia learned to, uh, learned to put out actually fake headlines work better during the Trump elections. They just found it, it wasn't that they were trying to upset the election results. They found that putting things uh, like Hillary wanted, Clinton, wanted Trump to win. That was one of the best. <laughs> got more clicks because more people thought, what? And they clicked. But I gotcha. So... <laughs> Strange, it's a strange world. Uh, I don't, I think now we realize that actually the world doesn't have to be like that. You, you people are technical people, right? You make things. When you look at something, like when my first per, parents looked at the first computers, you know, they knew they could, should be able to code it to do anything, right? When you look at a computer now, most of the people out there, when they open a computer, it's like a fridge, it's a white thing. They look at it and they, and you know, it's like the fridge. If it doesn't have enough nice things in it, they go and buy stuff and they, put it, they populate it with nice apps. But they don't think of it as a programmable thing, but you do. When you open a computer and you look at it and, it's, uh, and, and it does something which, uh, where you can imagine it being different, if you can imagine it being better, then you can go out and code it. That's why it's this realization that, that you have, and lots of people don't, but this is why you need to teach lots and lots of people to code. Partly because they realize the possibility, partly so they don't take stuff for granted. So we need people, we need lawyers, we need um, people in parliament uh, who understand <coughs> this about technology too. But so you, can, so you look at this, and when you look at a, a computer, you can, uh, if you don't like the apps, you can write 
new apps, and you also realize when you look at something like a social network, that the same guy wrote, the, that, wrote that social network. And um, somebody, because somebody wrote the, the, the social network, that means that uh, they could change it. You could write another one. You can, if you f worry about a social network, <clears throat> you wonder about whether, in fact, it uh, maybe uh, uh, it, it isn't very constructive. It isn't a place where it's where a place where if people uh, express hatred, that hatred sort of builds up. Whereas they express love, the love dies out or doesn't build up as much as the hatred. For example, you can uh, then you can look at and think. Maybe just changing the color of the like buttons. You know, maybe just moving, changing the way the retweet works. Maybe just changing the way the Reddit the up and down buttons can be used by people who have less and more or less kudos or something will actually create a completely new world. So I, I, I think that's one of the really important things to learn from this is that we've got um, that <clears throat> an opportunity to look at all the social networks we use and, and to imagine new ones. Uh, what the Web Foundation has just come up with recently, uh, the, I was at the Web Summit in Lisbon a few days ago, and there we announced uh, one the uh, Web Foundation response to some of these issues, a bunch of these issues, in fact. So we said, the Web Foundation says, we, we need a contract for the web because why a contract? Well, we've had manifestos, we've had uh, all kinds of things for the web. We, um, we've had uh, uh, before, but now why a contract for the web? Contract is about different people putting in different things. And so the contract uh, for the web means, uh, re recognizes the fact that people, uh, individuals need to behave uh, in certain ways. And, Governments need to behave in certain ways, and corporations need to behave in certain ways. And if everybody behaves in certain ways, if we figure out what does it take for a government to, what, is it, what does a government agency need to do? What regulations do you need to remove or to put in? What, uh, what best practices do you want companies to be able to do? So you've got governments, Companies and individuals all have their own roles. You as an individual, you have a role in the web contract uh, to uh, partly to behave, try to you know, be part of the truth system, part, you know, help with Wikipedia, uh, help with be, make sure that you don't retweet things unless you've, if you, it, just because it makes you mad. Don't, just don't retweet it unless you check that it's true. So little things like that, little things that, that individuals can do. But also individuals can hold governments and companies uh, accountable. So you can protest, you can take up every now and again, we have to do this, folks. Every now and again, you have to get, a, get the broomstick, take the broom off of it, you have to go at, get a piece of cardboard and you have to attach it to the broom and you have to write on it. It's good to write on both sides. Um, <clears throat> and so different things on both sides, you can make some jokes, but then you put your message and you go down to the town square and you, pro and you march, you have to march for science, so you have to march for net neutrality or, some, or, every, or you have to march against government spies uh, you have to march against uh, firewalls and blocking and the censorship and so on. So governments sometimes get it, go astray. Sometimes governments don't do what they do and they're, oh, they're, they're responsible to the citizens. So, so sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes we have to just <coughs> protest. Uh, sometimes we have, have to protest companies. Sometimes you have to boycott, boycott companies because they have decided, they decided that, that they're business interests will be, uh, uh, will be better served by breaking some fundamental rule, something like net, net neutrality, or they built something which is, discriminates against women, or they built something which discriminates by race or something. And so when you speak, see that, it's partly knowing that you guys are all going to protest and <laughs> drop their products keeps companies on the, on the straight and narrow. So if, if you go to um, contract for the uh, to, uh, Web Foundation, dot org slash for the web then uh, I don't want uh, <coughs> web foundation you've got it <laughs> web foundation dot web foundation dot org 
slash for the web. <laughs> and then, so click on the poster window <laughs> afterwards. So, uh, hashtag for the web. So, uh, the, uh, so that's uh, getting involved in that. The, the, the contract for the web isn't a thing that's all written. It's a thing that's going to be discussed from now until uh, into April. So do get involved in those discussions. Start discussions near you. Have sort of contract for the web tracks in your conferences and so on. Uh, these things are uh, the, the, these things are sometimes boring, sometimes important. But if you uh, if you spend 98% of your time using the web and generally taking the infrastructure for granted, then 2% of your time you should spend looking after it, uh, making sure, uh, fighting for it. So uh, the contract for the web is a way to do it. So I said I'd, uh, I'd look back and I'd look at uh, the current state and I'd look forward in a way. The, now the contract for the web is about, it's about positive moves to go forward. It's about uh, in reaction to the current state. There's also, I've personally been involved for a while in technology. The technology I tend to use myself uh, has tended to be different from the way most people design apps. A uh, little group of us have been working at MIT in a project called Solid, um, which where we, Instead of building uh, web apps where with the normal method, the normal way you build a web app is you build the, uh, the user interface and you'll build the back end. The user interface runs as code that runs in the browser, and the back end runs you know, typically JavaScript and PHP, it used to be. You can use all kinds of things on the server now, but uh, typically, anytime, if, when you made whatever it is, you made a little an uh, app for figuring out when can we all meet together, for example. You make this app for when can we all meet together, and you get when can we all meet together.com, like doodle.com or something, and, and, do, and doodle.com has got uh, the, uh, a bunch of JavaScript and it's got a bunch of PHP. And every time the idea about a schedule changes, every time the data model changes, every time somebody needs a new, functional, little, a new function, then that means the schema of the database has to change, and the API has to change, and the code in the front end changes. All that changes together. You have to try and release it all together, and you have to convert. If, you, <laughs> if it's a product, you have to convert the old data into the new. And uh, well, that's one way of doing it. And what we've done with Solid is we say, actually, there will be no back-end programming. Actually, there is lots of, if you're a back-end programmer, do not object. I have people get obsessed at that point. <laughs> there will be plenty of back-end programming. But, you, but when you're back programming the back-end, you program these gen uh, generic back-end. You take all your favorite systems, your favorite operating systems, and you build on top of it a solid server. And a solid server has just got one API. It doesn't have a Twitter API, and a Facebook API, and a Strava API, and a doodle.com API, and a GitHub API. It just said one API, because that API allows the app to, write, uh, to run any, to, uh, to write any structured data at once. It allows, it writes, it's a, the solid world is a read-write web world. It's a world in which you can treat the web as though it was a disk. You can photographs in it, you can create a folder, you can put photographs in the folder, and then when you want to track what the user chooses to make a photo album out of, then you put a data file in the web, and the data file sits there, but, and it's at one time a file, but it's also a database. So the way SolidWorks is that as somebody changes, as they go down starring things, as they go down changing the order of things in their, in their photo album, you're dragging around things on the screen, and you're just sending commands Fast, they're called HTTP patches, if you want, uh, down to it. And we'll talk about this more, more detail tomorrow. But basically, what happens is that the app uses the fact that the solid platform is just this big sink of structured data. The, the, solid, the solid server doesn't care what app it is running. All it does is allow is allowed to store the structured data. It does two things. It does allow you to store the structured data, and it does access control. So Solid is about looking at the world differently 
it's about working at the world in which you're very enabled. The solid idea is that you should control all your data. You should have complete control of your data. So we say, OK, solid apps will store the data. And when they start, they will ask you where to store the data. You want to take some photographs, and you say, OK, this is a work. I'm doing this for work, so I'll store it in the work pod, we call it. A pod is where you store your data. I have a work pod and a home pod. And I may have a couple of other pods. I may have things to do with diff well, different jobs I work in, different companies I'm involved in, uh, different, I have, may have one, one I share with the family. But it's, if you like, it's having sort of disks in the cloud. You can think of them as their, their, you think of them as personal data stores. You can think of them as like a thumb drive uh, in the cloud, but it's your personal cloud. You guys are actually, I have mine running at home. So a lot of the, a lot of the people, so I fired, fired up a solid server and I've had one running at home for years. So I've got one, uh, that's the way I work. I, I just like to have my own system that I can reboot. Uh, and I run solid software on it, so you can go out and so if uh, say the, the solid sy the system is at is that if you're a user, you probably should wait until next year uh, because it's a bit rough around the edges. If you're a developer, please help, <laughs> help us uh, make it less rough around the edges. Please help us make the server. We have our server which is written in Node, uh, called uh, which is on NPN Node server uh, Node solid server, and we have a. Uh, and we have a bunch of apps which we're playing with. The main thing is to get the server very robust. And so uh, these are exciting times. I, I, again, I feel we need to do a little bit of technology. We need to have a movement. We need to get people using the web again. And the web is in this, we need a mid-course correction here. The solid project is, okay, let's reboot it in a way that people have control of their data, that it's, again, decentralized. We have uh, people, whether, wherever they're, Websites are people have you know people again can blog they can construct things they can link to things it's not just about blogs it's about all kinds of apps all your favorite apps you can port to solid so that they run you'll find when they run in a solid world it's a world of linked data so because all of these pods uh, all of any objects in these pods have a URL and they can link to any other URL and so the the things you build can run over all of the data which you have access to and all the data you have that your friends have given you access to, all of the public data as well. And so you will be building thick structures which might end up quite small and might end up actually becoming indirectly quite big and complicated and might end up re revealing new insights because you will be able to capture the relationships between things. Like being, uh, if the original web had been like a, it was <laughs> designed to be originally when I make the next machine, the original web was, you could make, you could just make a link from one place to another <clears throat> just by uh, control M, control L, c uh, command S, save everything back, and you could make links in a way. Writing apps using Solid is a bit like that. You can make links between anything. You can make a reference to a person or an event, someone which is uh, anywhere else on the, uh, on the web. So it's exciting times, exciting times for me. I've taken a sabbatical from MIT, so I'm, well, I'm <clears throat> so I've got a startup in Boston. I, haven't worked for a startup since the early 1980s. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's great to be back in an environment where uh, we, can, we have some resources and we can throw it at the project, but the project is ridiculously huge. So all we can do, uh, uh, interrupt.com, I-N-R-U-P-T.com, sorry, yes, that's it's for innovation and disruption, uh, okay, and it's not very long, and it was available as, an, as a domain name. Okay, so that's what it is. It's interrupt.com, and, and that's the startup. The startup obviously can't do solid. All it can do is put its best efforts into trying to figure out what needs to be done. Do we need to write tutorials? Do we need to uh, write developer frameworks to help people using React or using Vue to use solid? Do we need to... Uh, Port, help people port the thing from Node to Go to, uh, to, to, to different systems. Well, so much stuff to do. So, in, so what Interrupt as a company will do, maybe a little bit like Netscape back in the day, well, we will make sure that stuff gets done 
uh, we will assume that most of it will get picked up by other people. We will, down the, down the road, pick up some commercial products. Uh, maybe you'll have some, uh, particularly some, of the, uh, some enterprise products will, be, will come out of the, uh, out of the interrupt uh, system, uh, company. But it's, the main thing is the solid movement and the attitude it has. You should own your own data. When you, if you start, if you start with a concept that you should own your own data, then look at the technology that, uh, that we put together. Look at the technological implications of just one big API. It's a paradigm shift. I mean, it's all using web technology, right? There's all HTTP gets and HTTP puts, but the way you use it by having only one API is very different. And so the uh, and so, uh, it's exciting. Maybe it won't work because people find it just too difficult to wrap their heads around it. Uh, but uh, I do invite you, particularly as developers, do, get, do come and get involved, pay, uh, teach each other about how it works, help us write documentation, help us write code, and help us build a new world which is respects people, which is decentralized like the web was, where individual... Uh, so in, in, creativity and in, in innovation, individual um, creativity can, if you like, uh, group creativity as well. That's what I want, just so we can end up leveraging, working together to be able to solve these huge problems out there. Uh, and on the way, maybe we will also build systems that run on top of solid, which are great for democracy and great for science as well. Who knows? But uh, if you don't try, you don't succeed. Thanks. Thank you so much. <coughs> really heavy chairs, yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much for the, for the talk. Um, I love these presentations where you can put your history more in place on events from the past. Um, so I read actually uh, somewhere recently, because I was researching a lot about what you were doing, and that um, if you had developed a system for monetizing domain names, and you had charged a few dollars per domain name, you would have been a trillionaire today. Um, is not so much a question, but it's just, have you ever, like, imagined how big a success Damn. your... <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> how big a success your, your invention uh, eventually became? Yeah, and so and I don't know whether fortunately or unfortunately. So it turns out that um, <coughs> the web taking off was not obvious. There were plenty of tech, there were plenty of other competing technologies, and so, and in fact, one of the criteria I said it had to be universal. In a way, being universal, everybody has got to be able to build a server. Everybody has. You can't ask that. Ask that everybody uses your weird HTTP system, and also ask them to all to give you ten cents. They will immediately go out and make their own proprietary systems, in, which will be incompatible. And the incompatible systems will be just like the you know, just like as, as usual. They wouldn't have you wouldn't have been able to link to everything. The web wouldn't have worked if it had, been, had not been free. Sorry. I, f I fully understand, but it's a but, nice thought experiment. Um, I guess uh, Diana. But well, if you if you've made gazillions of dollars out of the out of the web, you you just sent yes, your checks are all appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Diana, she is actually um, running our <clears throat> go to Berlin conference, and um, so it's also an honor to have you here today. Um, Thank you. So you have a few questions from the audience. I have a few questions from the audience. That's right, and uh, as I did before, I will uh, either read or rephrase them. So, what do you think uh, would have been different if you would have not started with CERN, but with a uh, private company? Well, CERN, uh, I think I would have, I've worked at a few private companies. I worked at uh, Plessy Telecommunications, which was a big one, and I worked at um, uh, and I worked at a, a couple of startups uh, building sort of smart printers, and uh, that was it. Was really exciting. Fun, 
uh, because of the, 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 the new technology. But I wouldn't have had, but in a way, CERN was this great Petri dish. It was, it was like a, a, a Petri dish filled with agar. There was a combination of things at CERN which I think wouldn't, uh, which <clears throat> was really valuable for starting the web. And what do you think would have changed for the web? Uh, I wouldn't have invented it. <laughs> there you have it. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have been. Mike Sendel wouldn't have been able to give me a bunch of months to uh, to just buy a next computer because it seemed like a good idea. I wouldn't. He wouldn't have done it because he he wouldn't have heard me go on and on about it at all these coffees at all these drinks. Uh, Uh, we wouldn't have been, I would have been sitting you know, in some little company instead of sitting out the CERN cafeteria in, which was told, called Tortellas at the time, you know, with the views of the mountains, where, and the, and the sort of, the, 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 this very much a spirit of, uh, <coughs> you know, the, CERN had been told to do more with less, uh, because whereas the funding gets cut, but you still have to make a huge, you know, so be, in, be inventive. Uh, and the people around me, all wacky. Uh, a lot of them physicists, a lot of them would, a lot of them very, uh, very creative. Uh, I think, in a way, lots of ways in which CERN was a very valuable place to stay, and perhaps unique. I want to I wanna have a follow-up question to that, <laughs> because um, it, it fits. Do you ever regret creating the web? No. Good. We leave it at that. <laughs> There's a long question. There's a long answer. We'll do that. that's the short answer. I'll give you the long. I won't give you the long answer. <laughs> okay. So um, a little bit follow up on that because in your in your talk you said um, there is also a lot of bad stuff on on the web, and there are these fake news and how to print guns and whatever there is there, and um, so there are companies like like uh, Apple, for instance, with the App Store, that kind of um, restrict a lot what you can actually publish. With their, within their app store. What do you think about that way of controlling what goes to normal consumers? I think that as long as, uh, in a way, uh, there the, are the, the lot of things on the web which are uh, like sort of clubs, which you can join or not join. So as long as it is, as long as you have a choice that you can decide, okay, I'm going to get a, buy a closed system because life is too short for me to be constantly being attacked I want, to buy a, I want to buy a system which is locked down, controlled by somebody else. Uh, <clears throat> like, I, you know, or I may be a, uh, or, but as long as I have a choice, as long as I have a choice, or you know, I want to be able, but uh, always I must have the choice to be able to buy a system, whether it's a phone or a laptop, where I have root access, where I can control everything, where I can install whatever I want. I think that's sort of, um, among the fundamental, it's not the right to have root access on your computer isn't up there among the <laughs> United Nations list of human rights. But when, uh, but uh, I think people got a lot uh, very upset when they, when they were pr protesting about uh, closed platforms. So I, I, you know, I think, for example, with the solid world, I think there will be, you'll be able to install it, use any solid apps you like. But maybe one of the things we can do within Routes is to say there will be some apps where There will be no advertising, there will be mon no monetization of data. The app will be programmed just to do what the user wants to do, not to distract them. And the developers will join a club of the beneficent app club, and they will be beneficent app developers. And so well, we could have a beneficent app uh, store where everything that's in it is, uh, is, has been But, you know, past this, this huge high bar that it's been developed, that it's not, uh, it doesn't mislead, it doesn't trick the user. And so I think that would, that would be valuable in a way I might want, if I want to give my kids a computer, I might tell them, no, I'll give them a computer where I've locked it down to say, you can only use beneficent apps because otherwise it's too dangerous out there. And as you get older, then I'll give you, the, you can download everything. But But I'll, when, when you can explain to me the difference between, you can show me how to find out whether, what, a, what if you can show me <coughs> how you know how to run uh, Wireshark on your computer and find out where the, <laughs> where the, uh, what, where it's, uh, uh, where your apps are actually contacting, then sure, then you can in install everything. But so I think, yeah, that's, uh, got to, people have got to be able to have ch ch uh, ch uh, choice. And that choice has got to be, you've got to be able to 
be able to choose something which is protected, if you want. Is Solid the next step for revolutionizing the web as we know it? And uh, what do you think are the main challenges? Whoa. Uh, yes, yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, Solid deals with a large chunk of that. Solid, Solid produces a system where the personal data and also a lot of the collaborative data, is in, so we should be able to build a lot, lot of collaborative platforms on top of Solid. Maybe we'll end up also building pu publication platforms. Maybe we'll end up building newspapers and stuff on, on top of Solid, in fact, as well. So yeah, but, uh, Solid, in fact, uh, and having, uh, so uh, the challenges are huge. Uh, one of them is we have to get everybody to adopt a single uh, a, a system where everybody has a URL which identifies them. Well, you can have several different ones. They can, some of them could be secret, but you have a URL which identifies them. And you have to have a way of authentication to do that. So at the moment, we're using uh, OID connect, o OIDC, uh, which is sort of based on an OAuth. We've got we've used uh, other. Uh, we've used certificate-based public key systems before that. Um, one of the challenges is finding a secure authentication system which everybody will, uh, will use. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, in a way, when we've done that, then you'll be able to log in with, you know, log in with F, log in with G, log in with S. Uh, you may see that, see that popping up. I think that's, you know, that's the, in a way the, the first <coughs> challenge is to get that done. Then the next the huge challenge is that whenever, uh, even though the solid, even though you've got all the solid servers are completely meet the solid spec. That is, get, is the challenge is the app, what I call the client-client specs. The fact that all the apps have to write data in the same format. Getting everybody, we've already defined this is uh, if you write contacts information in. So we have to get uh, then that's uh, relatively straightforward, uh, but. <clears throat> because people, there's, there's a lot of uh, interrupt about contacts, but every domain we have to make standards. And so the people working on, for example, fitness, all the people doing fitness apps, uh, fitness m machines have to get together. It may be that some of the standards will just, they've already got them, or they already go for, you know, Garmin, they already use Garmin for fitness or something like that. But all, getting, getting all those together, it's a bit, when you look at the work that schema.org did, uh, those folks, they put together a big, uh, a, a huge amount of standardization. They did it kind of quietly in the back end without getting a lot of people getting excited. <coughs> we have to do, well, we may, we, we, we may use that, but getting, getting, getting all the app developers to agree on the same formats, I think, is, that's, the, that's always the big challenge. Thank you. Um, maybe one final little thing. Um, so have... So, I mean, you could either go um, maybe starting in the public space in government and start with, with the information that are in healthcare or something. Um, or, you could, or you could call Mark Zuckerberg and say, why don't we start with you and Facebook? You know, what, what do you think is, uh, is that something you have considered where it will have traction first? Um, well, we have talked to uh, Google about hosting pods, we, uh, and that seems very logical if they, you know, they have G Drive, for example. Uh, I've got a call where I really need to talk to the Dropbox people, because if, in a way, Dropbox, the terms and conditions are just the sort of thing you'd expect from a pod provider, they have to put the a solid API on the, uh, on so all the things like Dropbox and Box.net and Net.box and things are all, uh, those are all the very clear early adopters the, uh, they're sort of slam dunk. They should be adopting solid. Then different apps. I think it may be that when you look at a social network like Facebook, they may decide clearly storing all the data has just got, in, just got us into trouble and, uh, and got more and more complicated because if we try to be all the apps to all the people, uh, then it's, uh, we can't really do that. But what we do want to be, we want to be the page that somebody's looking at. We want to be the app that somebody's looking at. So we will be trying to be the, the, uh, the mega app. We will be the app which controls all the apps. We will be, we, we will be your control panel and your dock in, uh, and your <coughs> desktop uh, for all your solid stuff. And we'll give you access to all the solid stuff. And we'll be the place where all your solid apps can plug in. But we'd like you to start off 
with us because we want you to be sitting lo looking at us, for example. That. So lots of different ways in which th things could go in. And it may be that, uh, but it may be that uh, one particular domain, like fitness, say we may get a bunch of fitness creep. You may be out here now. Maybe today there will be a group of people in your audience deciding, I've, wanted or, I've always wanted to do the fitness app thing, and now I realize if I do it as a solid app, that will be, it could actually connect all the fitness things together. And so we may get some, some particular vertical, which ends up being the, the early adopter space. Yeah, so last week I created a pod. I went to Inrobbed and, and it's hosted at Solid. Um, so maybe until tomorrow, you can all give it a go. And for those who go to the talk, um, we can start playing with that. You can, there's two s providers at the moment. Well, there's a few out there now, but uh, one of them is one of the ones which Interrupt runs is interrupt.net and solid.community. And so th those are both run by uh, uh, Interrupt, and there are various other ones which are turning up uh, <coughs> as we speak. So by the time you get there, there may be other. Uh, there may be other ones in the lists. But uh, yes, if you do, and realize that it is rough around the edges, that uh, so we're, we're <coughs> the way to, if you get to, if you go to your public folder, then and you can try, you can create new folders, you can create a few, like I would put, create some folders for the date, for the year, for the, for the month, and then within that you can create things like meetings and chats and things. Uh, <coughs> and, and so play, if you play with the, ch the chat, what we've done, in uh, uh, when we've given talks to small numbers of people, then we've said everybody in the room go to join the same chat, put the, the share amongst yourselves the, the URL of the chat that somebody has made, making sure it's open to public, give it public uh, read access, public write access, if you want anybody to be able to join. And then when you go into the chat, then you can you'll see all the people who've that you've told about the chat in the chat and. Their web ID, their solid ID will be uh, available to you. We will then do things with them because if you drag their name out of the chat, you can, for example, drive it into your list of uh, uh, what we've done before is uh, uh, you go to the profile editor, you can find a list of, you can, you can create a social network out of the people in the, in the chat. So we've done that within sort of the, the time. I'm not going to do that <laughs> tomorrow. I'm just going to give a talk tomorrow. Uh, I think <coughs> even though you might have great Wi-Fi also, it would, be <laughs> it would be demanding a lot of the Wi-Fi gods and the demo gods. But that's the sort of thing which has uh, uh, happened. And there's a Gitter chat is where we, do, we, where we discuss it. Thank you so much. Let's all give a hand to Sir Timothy. Thank you.